Part five of History of the Thirty Years War, Volume five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Thirty Years War, Volume five by Friedrich Schiller. Part five. The French army, sensibly weakened by an expedition undertaken at so severe a season of the year, had, after the taking of Rothweil, withdrawn into the neighborhood of Duttlingen, where it lay in complete security, without expectation of a hostile attack. In the meantime, the enemy collected a considerable force, with a view to prevent the French from establishing themselves beyond the Rhine and so near to Bavaria, and to protect that quarter from their ravages. The imperialists, under Hatzfeld, had formed a junction with the Bavarians under Mercy, and the Duke of Lorraine, who, during the whole course of the war, was generally found everywhere except in his own duchy, joined their united forces. It was resolved to force the quarters of the French in Duttlingen and the neighboring villages by surprise, a favorite mode of proceeding in this war, and which, being commonly accompanied by confusion, occasioned more bloodshed than a regular battle. On the present occasion there was the more to justify it, as the French soldiers, unaccustomed to such enterprises, conceived themselves protected by the severity of the winter against any surprise. John de Velt, a master in this species of warfare, which he had often put in practice against Gustavus Horn, conducted the enterprise and succeeded, contrary to all expectation. The attack was made on a side where it was least looked for, on account of the woods and narrow passes, and a heavy snowstorm which fell upon the same day, the 24th of November, 1643, concealed the approach of the vanguard till it halted before Duttlingen. The whole of the artillery without the place, as well as the neighboring castle of Hornburg, were taken without resistance. Duttlingen itself was gradually surrounded by the enemy, and all connection with the other quarters and the adjacent villages silently and suddenly cut off. The French were vanquished without firing a cannon. The cavalry owed their escape to the swiftness of their horses, and the few minutes in advance which they had gained upon their pursuers. The infantry were cut to pieces, or voluntarily laid down their arms. About two thousand men were killed, and seven thousand, with twenty-five staff officers and ninety captains, taken prisoners. This was, perhaps, the only battle in the whole course of the war, which produced nearly the same effect upon the party which gained and that which lost. Both these parties were Germans. The French disgraced themselves. The memory of this unfortunate day, which was renewed one hundred years after at Rosbach, was indeed erased by the subsequent heroism of a Turenne and a Condé, but the Germans may be pardoned if they indemnified themselves for the miseries which the policy of France had heaped upon them by these severe reflections upon her intrepidity. Meantime, this defeat of the French was calculated to prove highly disastrous to Sweden, as the whole power of the emperor might now act against them, while the number of their enemies was increased by a formidable accession. Torstenson had, in September 1643, suddenly left Moravia and moved into Silesia. The cause of this step was a secret, and the frequent changes which took place in the direction of his march contributed to increase his perplexity. From Silesia, after numberless circuits, he advanced towards the Elbe, while the imperialists followed him into Lusatia. Throwing a bridge across the Elbe at Torgau, he gave out that he intended to penetrate through Meissen into the upper Palatinate in Bavaria. At Balbi he also made a movement, as if to pass that river, but continued to move down the Elbe as far as Havelburg, where he astonished his troops by informing them that he was leading them against the Danes in Holstein. The partiality which Christian the Fourth had displayed against the Swedes in his office of mediator, the jealousy which led him to do all in his power to hinder the progress of their arms, the restraints which he laid upon their navigation of the sound, and the burdens which he imposed upon their commerce, had long roused the indignation of Sweden, and at last, when these grievances increased daily, had determined the regency to measures of retaliation dangerous as it seemed to involve the nation in a new war, when, even amidst its conquests, it was almost exhausted by the old, the desire of revenge, and the deep-rooted hatred which subsisted between Danes and Swedes, prevailed over all other considerations. And even the embarrassment in which hostilities with Germany had plunged it, 
only served as an additional motive to try its fortune against Denmark. Matters were, in fact, arrived at last to that extremity that the war was prosecuted merely for the purpose of furnishing food and employment to the troops, that good winter quarters formed the chief subject of contention, and that success, in this point, was more valued than a decisive victory. But now the provinces of Germany were almost exhausted and laid waste. They were wholly destitute of provisions, horses, and men, which, in Holstein, were to be found in profusion. If by this movement Torstensen should succeed merely in recruiting his army, providing subsistence for his horses and soldiers, and remounting his cavalry, all the danger and difficulty would be well repaid. Besides, it was highly important, on the eve of negotiations for peace, to diminish the injurious influence which Denmark might exercise upon these deliberations, to delay the treaty itself, which threatened to be prejudicial to the Swedish interests, by sowing confusion among the parties interested, and with a view to the amount of indemnification, to increase the number of her conquests in order to be the more sure of securing those which alone she was anxious to retain. Moreover, the present state of Denmark justified even greater hopes, if only the attempt were executed with rapidity and silence. The secret was in fact so well kept in Stockholm that the Danish minister had not the slightest suspicion of it, and neither France nor Holland were let into the scheme. Actual hostilities commenced with the declaration of war, and Torstensen was in Holstein before even an attack was expected. The Swedish troops, meeting with no resistance, quickly overran this duchy, and made themselves masters of all its strong places, except Rendsburg and Gluckstadt. Another army penetrated into Schonen, which made as little opposition, and nothing but the severity of the season prevented the enemy from passing the Lesser Baltic and carrying the war into Funen and Zealand. The Danish fleet was unsuccessful at Fehmal, and Christian himself, who was on board, lost his right eye by a splinter. Cut off from all communication with the distant force of the emperor, his ally, this king was on the point of seeing his whole kingdom overrun by the Swedes and all things threatened the speedy fulfilment of the old prophecy of the famous Tycho Brahe, that in the year 1644 Christian IV should wander in the greatest misery from his dominions. But the emperor could not look on with indifference while Denmark was sacrificed to Sweden, and the latter strengthened by so great an acquisition. Notwithstanding great difficulties lay in the way of so long a march through desolated provinces, he did not hesitate to dispatch an army into Holstein, under Count Gallus, who, after Piccolomini's retirement, had resumed the supreme command of the troops. Gallus accordingly appeared in the duchy, took Kyle, and hoped, by forming a junction with the Danes, to be able to shut up the Swedish army in Jutland. Meantime, the Hessians, and the Swedish general Königsmark, were kept in check by Hatzfeldt and the Archbishop of Bremen, the son of Christian IV and afterwards the Swedes drawn into Saxony by an attack upon Meissen. But Torstensen, with his augmented army, penetrated through the unoccupied pass betwixt Schleswig and Stapelholm, met Gallus, and drove him along the whole course of the Elbe, as far as Baumburg, where the imperialists took up an entrenched position. Torstensen passed the Saal, and by posting himself in the rear of the enemy, cut off their communication with Saxony and Bohemia, scarcity and famine began now to destroy them in great numbers and force them to retreat to magdeburg where however they were not much better off the cavalry which endeavoured to escape into silesia was overtaken and routed by torstensen near utabok the rest of the army after a vain attempt to fight its way through the swedish lines was almost wholly destroyed near magdeburg from this expedition, Gallus brought back only a few thousand men of all his formidable force, and the reputation of being a consummate master in the art of ruining an army. The King of Denmark, after this unsuccessful effort to relieve him, sued for peace, which he obtained at Bremsebor in the year 1645, under very unfavorable conditions. Torstensen rapidly followed up his victory, and while Axel Lilienstern, one of the generals who commanded under him, overawed Saxony, and Königsmark subdued the whole of Bremen, he himself penetrated into Bohemia with 16,000 men and 80 pieces of artillery, and endeavoured a second time to remove the seat of war into the hereditary dominions of Austria. 
Ferdinand, upon this intelligence, hastened in person to Prague, in order to animate the courage of the people by his presence, and as a skilful general was much required, and so little unanimity prevailed among the numerous leaders, he hoped in the immediate neighborhood of the war to be able to give more energy and activity. In obedience to his orders, Hatzfeldt assembled the whole Austrian and Bavarian force, and, contrary to his own inclination and advice, formed the emperor's last army, and the last bulwark of his states, in order of battle to meet the enemy who were approaching at Jankowitz on the 24th of February, 1645. Ferdinand depended upon his cavalry, which outnumbered that of the enemy by three thousand, and upon the promise of the Virgin Mary, who had appeared to him in a dream, and given him the strongest assurances of a complete victory. The superiority of the imperialists did not intimidate Torstensen, who was not accustomed to number his antagonists. On the very first onset, the left wing, which Goetz, the general of the League, had entangled in a disadvantageous position among marshes and thickets, was totally routed. The general, with the greater part of his men, killed, and almost the whole ammunition of the army taken. This unfortunate commencement decided the fate of the day. The Swedes, constantly advancing, successively carried all the most commanding heights. After a bloody engagement of eight hours, a desperate attack on the part of the imperial cavalry, and a vigorous resistance by the Swedish infantry, the latter remained in possession of the field. Two thousand Austrians were killed upon the spot, and Hatzfeld himself, with three thousand men, taken prisoners. Thus, on the same day, did the emperor lose his best general and his last army. This decisive victory at Jankowitz at once exposed all the Austrian territory to the enemy. Ferdinand hastily fled to Vienna to provide for its defense and to save his family and his treasures. In a very short time, the victorious Swedes poured like an inundation upon Moravia and Austria. After they had subdued nearly the whole of Moravia, invested Brünn, and taken all the strongholds as far as the Danube, and carried the entrenchments at the Wolf's Bridge near Vienna, they at last appeared in sight of that capital, while the care which they had taken to fortify their conquests showed that their visit was not likely to be a short one. After a long and destructive circuit through every province of Germany, the stream of war had at last rolled backwards to its source, and the roar of the Swedish artillery now reminded the terrified inhabitants of those balls which, twenty-seven years before, the Bohemian rebels had fired into Vienna. The same theatre of war brought again similar actors on the scene. Torstensen invited Ragotsky, the successor of Bethlen Gabor, to his assistance, as the Bohemian rebels had solicited that of his predecessor. Upper Hungary was already inundated by his troops, and his union with the Swedes was daily apprehended. The elector of Saxony, driven to despair by the Swedes taking up their quarters within his territories, and abandoned by the emperor, who, after the defeat at Jankowitz, was unable to defend himself, at length adopted the last and only expedient which remained, and concluded a truce with Sweden, which was renewed from year to year to the general peace. The emperor thus lost a friend, while a new enemy was appearing at his very gates, his armies dispersed, and his allies in other quarters of Germany defeated. The French army had effaced the disgrace of their defeat at Deutlingen by a brilliant campaign, and had kept the whole force of Bavaria employed upon the Rhine and in Swabia. Reinforced with fresh troops from France, which the great Turenne, already distinguished by his victories in Italy, brought to the assistance of the Duke of Enghien, they appeared on the 3rd of August, 1644, before Freiburg, which Mercy had lately taken, and now covered, with his whole army strongly entrenched. But against the steady firmness of the Bavarians, all the impetuous valor of the French was exerted in vain, and after a fruitless sacrifice of six thousand men, the Duke of Enghien was compelled to retreat. Mazarin shed tears over this great loss, which Condé, who had no feeling for anything but glory, disregarded. A single night in Paris, said he, gives birth to more men than this action has destroyed. The Bavarians, however, were so disabled by this murderous battle, that, far from being in a condition to relieve Austria from the menaced dangers, they were too weak even to defend the banks of the Rhine. Spires, Vomps, and Mannheim capitulated, the strong fortress of Philipsburg was forced to surrender by famine, and by a timely submission, Mentz hastened to disarm the conquerors.
Austria and Moravia, however, were now freed from Torstensen by a similar means of deliverance, as in the beginning of the war had saved them from the Bohemians. Rogotsky, at the head of 20,000 men, had advanced into the neighborhood of the Swedish quarters upon the Danube. But these wild, undisciplined hordes, instead of seconding the operations of Torstensen by any vigorous enterprise, only ravaged the country and increased the distress which, even before their arrival, had begun to be felt in the Swedish camp. To extort tribute from the emperor and money and plunder from his subjects was the sole object that had allured Rogotsky, or his predecessor, Bethlen Gabor, into the field, and both departed as soon as they had gained their end. To get rid of him, Ferdinand granted the barbarian whatever he asked, and by a small sacrifice freed his states of this formidable enemy. In the meantime, the main body of the Swedes had been greatly weakened by a tedious encampment before Brunn. Torstensen, who commanded in person, for four entire months employed in vain all his knowledge of military tactics. The obstinacy of the resistance was equal to that of the assault, while despair roused the courage of Souche, the commandant, a Swedish deserter, who had no hope of pardon. The ravages caused by pestilence, arising from famine, want of cleanliness, and the use of unripe fruit during their tedious and unhealthy encampment, with the sudden retreat of the Prince of Transylvania, at last compelled the Swedish leader to raise the siege. As all the passes upon the Danube were occupied, and his army greatly weakened by famine and sickness, he at last relinquished his intended plan of operations against Austria and Moravia, and contented himself with securing a key to these provinces by leaving behind him Swedish garrisons in the conquered fortresses. He then directed his march into Bohemia, whither he was followed by the imperialists under the Archduke Leopold. Such of the lost places as had not been retaken by the latter were recovered, after his departure, by the Austrian general Buchheim, so that, in the course of the following year, the Austrian frontier was again cleared of the enemy, and Vienna escaped with mere alarm. In Bohemia and Silesia, too, the Swedes maintained themselves only with a very variable fortune. They traversed both countries without being able to hold their ground in either. But if the designs of Torstensen were not crowned with all the success which they were promised at the commencement, they were nevertheless productive of the most important consequences to the Swedish party. Denmark had been compelled to a peace, Saxony to a truce. The emperor, in the deliberations for a peace, offered greater concessions. France became more manageable, and Sweden itself bolder and more confident in its bearing towards these two crowns. Having thus nobly performed his duty, the author of these advantages retired, adorned with laurels, into the tranquillity of private life, and endeavoured to restore his shattered health. By the retreat of Torstensen, the emperor was relieved from all fears of an eruption on the side of Bohemia. But a new danger soon threatened the Austrian frontier from Swabia and Bavaria. Turenne, who had separated from Condé and taken the direction of Swabia, had in the year 1645 been totally defeated by Mercy near Mergentheim, and the victorious Bavarians, under their brave leader, poured into Hesse. But the Duke of Enghien hastened with considerable succors from Alsace, Königsmark from Moravia, and the Hessians from the Rhine, to recruit the defeated army, and the Bavarians were in turn compelled to retire to the extreme limits of Swabia. Here they posted themselves at the village of Alasheim, near Nördlingen, in order to cover the Bavarian frontier. But no obstacle could check the impetuosity of the Duke of Enghien, in person, he led on his troops against the enemy's entrenchments, and a battle took place, which the heroic resistance of the Bavarians rendered most obstinate and bloody, till at last the death of the great Marcy, the skill of Turenne, and the iron firmness of the Hessians decided the day in favor of the Allies. But even this second barbarous sacrifice of life had little effect, either on the course of the war or on the negotiations for peace. The French army, exhausted by this bloody engagement, was still farther weakened by the departure of the Hessians, and the Bavarians, being reinforced by the Archduke Leopold, Turenne was again obliged hastily to recross the Rhine. The retreat of the French enabled the enemy to turn his whole force upon the Swedes in Bohemia. Gustavus Wrangel, no unworthy successor of Banna and Torstensen, had in 1646 been appointed commander-in-chief of the Swedish army, 
which, besides Königsmark's flying corps and the numerous garrisons disposed throughout the empire, amounted to about 8,000 horse and 15,000 foot. The Archduke, after reinforcing his army, which already amounted to 24,000 men, with 12 Bavarian regiments of cavalry and 18 regiments of infantry, moved against Wrangel, in the hope of being able to overwhelm him by a superior force before Königsmark could join him, or the French effect a diversion in his favour. Wrangel, however, did not await him, but hastened through Upper Saxony to the Weser, where he took Hörster and Paderborn. From thence he marched into Hesse, in order to join Turenne, and at his camp in Wetzlar was joined by the flying corps of Königsmark. But Turenne, fettered by the instructions of Mazarin, who had seen with jealousy the warlike prowess and increasing power of the Swedes, excused himself on the plea of a pressing necessity to defend the frontier of France on the side of the Netherlands, in consequence of the Flemings having failed to make the promised diversion. But as Wrangel continued to press his just demand, and a longer opposition might have excited distrust on the part of the Swedes, or induced them to conclude a private treaty with Austria, Turenne at last obtained the wished-for permission to join the Swedish army. End of Part 5 Recording by Owen Cook in Potawatomi Ceded Land Part 6 of History of the Thirty Years' War, Volume 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. History of the Thirty Years' War, Volume 5, by Friedrich Schiller. The junction took place at Giessen, and now they felt themselves strong enough to meet the enemy. The latter had followed the Swedes into Hesse in order to intercept their commissariat and to prevent their union with Rennes. In both designs they had been unsuccessful, and the imperialists now saw themselves cut off from the main and exposed to a great scarcity and want from the loss of their magazines. Wrangel took advantage of their weakness to execute the plan by which he hoped to give a new turn to the war. He, too, had adopted the maxim of his predecessor to carry the war into the Austrian states. But discouraged by the ill success of Torstenson's enterprise, he hoped to gain his end with more certainty by another way. He determined to follow the course of the Danube and to break into the Austrian territories through the midst of the Bavaria. A similar design had been formerly conceived by Gustavus Adolphus, which he had been prevented carrying into effect by the approach of Wallenstein's army and the danger of Saxony. Duke Bernard, moving in his footsteps and more fortunate than Gustavus, had spread his victorious banners between the Isar and the Inn, but the near approach of the enemy vastly superior in force obliged him to halt in his victorious career and lead back his troops wrangel now hoped to accomplish this object in which his predecessors had failed the more so as the imperial and bavarian army was far in his rear upon the land and could only reach bavaria by a long march through franconia and the upper palatinate he moved hastily upon the danube defeated a Bavarian course near Donauwelt and passed that river, as well as the lake, unopposed. But by wasting his time in the unsuccessful siege of Augsburg, he gave opportunity to the imperialists not only to relieve that city, but also to repulse him as far as Lauingen. No sooner, however, had they turned towards Swabia with a view to remove the war from Bavaria, then, seizing the opportunity, he repassed the lake and guarded the passage of it against the imperialists themselves. Bavaria now lay open and defenseless before him. The French and Swedes quickly overran it, and the soldiery indemnified themselves for all dangers by frightful outrages, robberies, and extortions. The arrival of the imperial troops who at last succeeded in passing the lake at Tierhaften, only increased the misery of this country, 
which friend and foe indiscriminately plundered. And now, for the first time during the whole course of this war, the courage of Maximilian, which for eight and twenty years had stood unshaken amidst the fearful dangers, began to waver. Ferdinand II, his school companion at Ingolstadt and the friend of his youth, was no more, and with the death of his friend and benefactor, the strong tie was dissolved which had linked the elector to the house of Austria. To the father, habit, inclination, and gratitude had attached him. The son was a stranger to his heart, and political interest alone could preserve his fidelity to the latter prince. Accordingly, the motives which the artifices of France now put in operation, in order to detach him from the Austrian alliance, and to induce him to lay down his arms, were drawn entirely from political consideration. It was not without a selfish object that Mazarin had so far overcome his jealousy of growing power of the Swedes as to allow the French to accompany them into Bavaria. His intention was to expose Bavaria to all the horror of the war, in the hope that the persevering fortitude of Maximilian might be subdued by necessity and despair, and the emperor deprived of his first and last ally. Brandenburg had, under his great sovereign, embraced the neutrality. Saxony had been forced to accede to it. The war with France prevented the Spaniards from taking any part in that of Germany. The peace with Sweden had removed Denmark from the theater of war, and Poland had been disarmed by a long truce. If they could succeed in detaching the Elector of Bavaria also from Austrian alliance, the Emperor would be without a friend in Germany and left to the mercy of the Allied powers. Ferdinand III saw his danger and left no means untried to avert it. But the elector of Bavaria was unfortunately led to believe that the Spaniard alone was disinclined to peace, and nothing but Spanish influence had induced the emperor so long to resist the cessation of hostilities. Maximilian detested the Spaniard and could never forgive their having opposed his application for the Palatine electorate. Could it then be supposed that in order to gratify this hated power, he would see his people sacrificed, his country lay waste, and himself ruined, when, by a cessation of hostilities, he could at once emancipate himself from all these distresses, procure for his people the repose of which they stood so much in need, and perhaps accelerate the arrival of general peace. All doubts disappeared, and, convinced of the necessity of this step, he thought he should sufficiently discharge his obligations to the emperor if he invited him also to share in the benefit of the truce. The deputies of three crowns and of Bavaria met at Ulm to adjust the conditions, but it was soon evident from the instructions of the Austrian ambassadors that it was not the intention of the emperor to second the conclusion of truce, but, if possible, to prevent it. It was obviously necessary to make the term acceptable to the Swedes, who had the advantage and had more to hope than to fear from the continuous of the war. They were the conquerors, and yet the emperor presumed to dictate to them. In the first transport of their indignation, the Swedish ambassadors were on the point of leaving the Congress, and the French were obliged to have recourse to threats in order to detain them. The good intentions of the Elector of Bavaria, to include the Emperor in the benefit of the truce, having been thus rendered unavailing, he felt himself justified in providing for his own safety. However hard were the conditions on which the truce was to be purchased, he did not hesitate to accept it on any terms. He agreed to the Swedes extending their quarters in Swabia and Franconia, and to his own being restricted to Bavaria and the Palatinate. The conquest which he made in Swabia was ceded to the Allies, who on their parts restored to him what they had taken from Bavaria. Cologne and Hesse Castle were also included in the truce. 
After the conclusion of this treaty upon the 14th March 1647, the French and Swedes left Bavaria, and in order not to interfere with each other, took up different quarters, the former in Württemberg, the latter in the upper Schwabia, in the neighborhood of Lake of Constance. On the extreme north of this lake, and on the most southern frontier of Swabia, the Austrian town of Bregenz, by its steep and narrow passes, seemed to defy attack. And in this persuasion, the whole peasantry of the surrounding villages had with their property taken refuge in this natural fortress. The rich booty which the store of provisions it contains gave reason to expect, and the advantage of possessing a pass into Tyrol, Switzerland, and Italy, induced the Swedish general to venture an attack upon this supposed impregnable post and town, in which he succeeded. Meantime, Turenne, according to agreement, marched into Württemberg, where he forced the landgrave of Darmstadt and elector of Mainz to imitate the example of Bavaria and to embrace the neutrality. And now, at last, France seems to have attained the great object of his policy, that of depriving the emperor of the support of the League and of his Protestant allies, and of dictating to him, sword in hand, the conditions of peace. Of all his once formidable power, an army not exceeding 12,000 was all that remained to him and this force he was driven to the necessity of entrusting the commands of a Calvinist, the Hessian deserter, Melander, as the casualties of war had stripped him of his best generals. But as this war had been remarkable for the sudden change of fortune it displayed, and as every calculation of the state policy had been frequently baffled by some unforeseen events, in this case also the issue disappointed expectation. And after a brief crisis, the fallen power of Austria rose again to a formidable strength. The jealousy which France entertained of the Sweden prevented it from permitting the total ruin of the emperor, or allowing the Swede to obtain such a preponderance in Germany as might have been destructive to France herself. Accordingly, the French minister declined to take advantage of the distress of Austria and the army of Trenne, separating from that of the Wrangel, retired to the frontier of the Netherlands. Wrangel, indeed, after moving from Swabia into Franconia, taking Schweinfurt and incorporating the imperial garrison of that place with his own army, attempted to make his way into Bohemia and laid siege in Igra, the key of that kingdom. To relieve this fortress, the emperor put his last army in motion and placed himself at its head, but obliged to take a long circuit in order to spare the lands of von Schlick, the president of the Council of War, he protracted his march, and on his arrival, Igra was already taken. Both armies were now in sight of each other, and a decisive battle was momentarily expected, as both were suffering from want and the two camps were only separated from each other by the space of the entrenchments. But the imperialists, although superior in numbers, contented themselves in keeping close to the enemy and harassing them by skirmishes, by fatiguing marches and famine, until the negotiations which had been opened with Bavaria was brought to a bearing. The neutrality of Bavaria was a wound under which the imperial court writhed impatiently and after in vain attempting to prevent it. Austria now determined, if possible, to turn it to advantage. Several officers of the Bavarian army had been offended by the step of their master, which at once reduced them to inaction and imposed a burdensome restraint on their restless disposition. Even the brave John de Welt was at the head of the malcontents, and encouraged by the emperor, he formed a plot to seduce the whole army from their allegiance to the elector, and led it over to the emperor. Ferdinand did not blush to patronize this act of treachery against his father's most trusted ally. He formally issued a proclamation to the Bavarian troops, in which he recalled them to himself, reminded them that they were the troops of the empire, 
which the elect had merely commanded in the name of the emperor. Fortunately for Maximilian, he detected the conspiracy in time enough to anticipate and prevent it by the most rapid and effective measures. This disgraceful conduct of the emperor might have justified the reprisal, but Maximilian was too old a statesman to listen to the voice of passion, where policy alone ought to be heard. He had not derived from the truce the advantages he expected. Far from tending to accelerate the general peace, it had a pernicious influence upon the negotiations at Munster and Osnaburg, and had made the allies bolder in their demands. The French and Swedes had indeed removed from Bavaria, but by the loss of his quarters in the Swabian circle, he found himself compelled either to exhaust his own traitors by the subsistence of his troops, or at once to disband them, and to throw aside the shield and spear at the very moment when the sword alone seemed to be the arbiter of right. Before embracing either of these certain evils, he determined to try a third step, the unfavorable issue of which was at least not so certain viz to renounce the truce and resume the war. This resolution and the assistance which he immediately dispatched to the emperor in Bohemia threatened materially to injure the Swedes, and Wrangel was compelled to in haste to evacuate that kingdom. He retired through the Tringia into Westphalia and Lunenburg in the hope of forming a junction with the French army on the train, while the imperial and Bavarian army followed him to the Weser on the Melander and Gronsfeld. His ruin was inevitable if the enemy should overtake him before his junction with Dren, but the same consideration which had just saved the emperor now proved the salvation of the Swedes. Even amidst of all fury of the conquest, cold calculation of prudence guided the course of the war, and the vigilance of different courts increased as the prospect of peace approached. The Elector of Bavaria could not allow the Emperor to obtain so decisive a preponderance as by the sudden alteration of affairs might delay the chances of general peace. Every change of fortune was important now, when a pacification was so ardently desired by all, and when the disturbance of the balance of power among the contracting parties might at once annihilate the work of years, destroy the fruits of long and tedious negotiations, and indefinitely protract the repose of Europe. If France sought to restrain the Swedish crown within due bounds, and measured out her assistance according to her success and defeats, the Elector of Bavaria silently undertook the same task with the Emperor, his ally, and determined, by prudently dealing out his aid, to hold the fate of Austria in his own hands. And now that the power of the Emperor threatened once more to attain a dangerous superiority, Maximilian at once ceased to pursue the Swedes. He was also afraid of reprisal from France who had threatened to direct Turenne's whole force against him if he allowed his troops to cross the Weser. Melander, prevented by the Bavarians from further pursuing Wrangel, crossed by Jena and Erfurt into Hesse, and now appeared as a dangerous enemy in the country which he had formerly defended. If it was the desire of revenge upon his former sovereign which led him to choose Hesse for the scene of his ravage, he certainly had his full gratification. Under this scourge, the miseries of that unfortunate state reached their height, but he had soon reason to regret that, in the choice of his quarters, he had listened to the dictates of revenge rather than of prudence. In this exhausted country, his army was oppressed by want, while Wrangel was recruiting his strength and remounting his cavalry in Lunenburg. Too weak to maintain his wretched quarters against the Swedish general, when he opened the campaign in the winter of 1648 and marched against Hesse, he was obliged to retire with disgrace and take refuge on the banks of the Danube. France had once more disappointed the expectation of Sweden and the armies of Turenne, disregarding the remonstrances of Wrangel, had remained upon the Rhine. The Swedish leader revenged himself by drawing into his service 
the cavalry of Weimar, which had abandoned the standard of France, though by this step he further increased the jealousy of that power. Turenne received permission to join the Swedes, and the last campaign of this eventful war was now opened by the united armies. Driving Melander before them along the Danube, they threw supplies into Igra, which was besieged by the imperialists, and defeated the imperial and Bavarian armies on the Danube, which ventured to oppose them at Susmarshausen, where Melander was mortally wounded. After this overthrow, the Bavarian general Gronsfeld placed himself on the further side of the Lech in order to guard Bavaria from the enemy. But Gronsfeld was not more fortunate than Tilly, who in this same position has sacrificed his life for Bavaria. Wrangel and Turenne chose the same spot for passing the river, which was so glorious marked by the victory of the Gustavus Adolphus, and accomplished it by the same means too which had favored their predecessor. Bavaria was now second time overrun, and the breach of the truce punished by the severest treatment of its inhabitants. Maximilian sought shelter in Salzburg, where the Swedes crossed the Isel and forced their way as far as the Inn. A violent and continued rain, which in a few days swelled this inconsiderable stream into a broad river, saved Austria once more from the threatened danger. The enemy ten times attempted to form a bridge of boats over the inn, and as often it was destroyed by the current. Never during the whole course of the war had the imperialists been in so great consternation as at present, when the enemy was in the center of Bavaria, and when they had no longer a general left who could be matched against the Turin, a Wrangel, and a Königsmark. At last, the brave Piccolomini arrived from the Netherlands to assume the commands of the feeble wreck of the imperialists. By their own ravages in Bohemia, the Allies had rendered their subsistence in that country impracticable and were at last driven by the scarcity to retreat into the Upper Palatinate, where the news of the peace put a period to their activity. Königsmark, with his flying corps, advanced toward the Bohemia where Ernst Odvarsky, a disbanded captain who, after being disabled in the imperial service, had been dismissed without a pension, laid before him a plan for surprising the lesser side of the city of Prague. Königsmark successfully accomplished the bold enterprise and acquired the reputation of closing the Thirty Years' War by the last brilliant achievement. This decisive stroke, which vanquished the emperor's irresolution, cost the Swedes only the loss of a single man. But the old town, the larger half of Prague, which is divided into two parts by the Moldau, by its vigorous resistance wearied out the efforts of the Palatine, Charles Gustavus, the successor of Christina on the throne, who had arrived from Sweden with fresh troops and had assembled the whole Swedish force in Bohemia and Silesia before its walls. The approach of winter at last drove the besiegers into their quarters, and in the meantime, the intelligence arrived that a peace had been signed at Münster on the 24th October. The colossal labor of concluding this solemn and ever memorable and sacred treaty, which is known by the name of Peace of Westphalia, the endless obstacles which were to be surmounted, the contending interests which it was necessary to reconcile, the concatenation of circumstances which must have cooperated to bring to a favorable termination this tedious but precious and permanent work of policy, the difficulties which beset the very opening of the negotiations and maintaining them when opened during the ever-fluctuating vicissitude of the war, finally arranging the conditions of peace and still more, the carrying them into effect. What were the conditions of this peace? what each contending power gained or lost, by the toils and sufferings of thirty years' war, what modification it wrought upon the general system of European policy. These are matters which must be relinquished to another pen. The history of the peace of Westphalia constitutes a whole as important as the history of the war itself. A mere abridgment of it would reduce to a mere skeleton 
one of the most interesting and characteristic monuments of human policy and passions, and deprive it of every feature calculated to fix the attention of the public, for which I write and of which I now respectfully take my leave. End of part six. End of history of the Thirty Years' War, volume five, by Friedrich Schiller. Translated by Reverend Alexander James William Morrison, 1806 to 1865.